Well, good evening, everybody. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 11. We'll take a look at the text, verses 16 through 24. Have a bit of a rewind of the things that we looked at on Sunday. And this is a passage where and Jesus is in the midst of uh, talking with the multitudes that were following him. But uh, here now he expands on the group that he's addressing and begins uh, speaking to a, a whole generation of people. A generation is everybody that would be alive at any particular time. And so Jesus is talking to everybody. And uh, he's got some things to say here that are very difficult to receive for everybody, at least some people. Uh, but he's got a very poor analysis of how he sees their generation. He says, what shall I liken them to? They're like, uh, it's like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance and we mourned for you and you didn't lament. Uh, these were just kind of childhood games that would have been uh, so regularly played. The people that Jesus was talking to would have understood what he was re referencing. But the idea of this is that uh, John and Jesus weren't well received and they couldn't be more different, the two of them. Uh, he says, John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. So John was uh, very self-denying and John was one who did not live in luxury. And so they accuse him of having a demon. Jesus, uh, son of man, he says, came eating and drinking. And they say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Uh, and Jesus goes, I came and I do eat with people and I do go to people's houses and I do go to weddings and I do hang out in social circles and I eat and drink and, and all the rest. And you don't like that either. And so Jesus is saying, you don't like John and you don't like me. And the similarity between the two of them, as we pointed out on Sunday, was that both Jesus and John preached a very similar message. Uh, both of them preached a message of repentance, and it was continual. Uh, the word repentance uh, means to change your mind after encountering the truth. And now, uh, what makes repentance so difficult for some people is that they just don't believe that what was said was true. They won't believe it, and so they won't repent. They won't change their mind. They're going to believe what they always believed, even before the truth was encountered. And so when you put a person in an environment like it would have been to be around John or uh, an environment like it would have been to hang around Jesus, where the message being preached is always along the lines of repentance and repentance and dealing with sin issues and requiring change of people and all the rest, um, people get tired of that. If they don't, if they don't repent, then they're just going to wear out. They don't like it. Uh, usually it's uh, because their repentance, if there was any at all, was shallow. Uh, it was just a, a surface sort of repentance. You remember that John baptized a baptism of repentance uh, but that's far different than living a lifestyle of repentance. Uh, uh, being dipped in a river, like John did, that doesn't change your mind. Okay, uh, What changes your mind is being in, uh, confronted by the truth and then thinking differently afterwards. And so a lot of these people had just experienced some water baptism and and that was it. Much like in our day, there's people who will experience a certain measure of religion everything that goes along with it, but nothing really changes. And not their mind, certainly not their mind. And so they continue on as always. And yet they find themselves still in the same ministry, in the same environment where repentance is expected and the truth is confrontational. And they, uh, they start to get irritated. These people here became bitter and critical of Jesus and John both. They started exaggerating things about them. Uh, John certainly wasn't possessed with a demon, but th that's the conclusion they came to because they were offended by his message. Uh, did Jesus uh, eat food? Yes. But was he a glutton? No. Uh, did Jesus drink wine? Yes. Was he a drunkard? No. A wine bibber? No. Uh, see, so they're just exaggerating 
to the point that they can conveniently dismiss the message that these folks were preaching. They, they're just trying to find a way to not have to change their mind and agree with what's true and what's right. They remind me of the parable that Jesus told about the sower who scattered seed. And some of it fell, of course, on the sidewalk and some of it fell on good ground. But the two soils in between, one of them had rocks in it. One of them was full of thorns. And it, this reminds me of those types of individuals whose repentance is so shallow that the roots of faith never grow very deep. And uh, it isn't long before they encounter that bedrock that prevents them from any further growth. And the Bible says they eventually then just wilt away and die. The sun scorches them and they don't make it. And that's people like this. Uh, they enjoyed John's preaching for a while. Uh, we're told, I, I think it's John 5, 36, John chapter 5, verse 35, that they rejoiced in the light of John for some time. They appreciated his message for a while, uh, but obviously that didn't last. And the reason is, is because unrepentant people can only tolerate a message of repentance for so long. Be before too long, that message begins to threaten uh, some particular sin that they're trying to guard, uh, some particular issue that they're trying to keep hidden. Uh, they're trying to protect it from the truth that keeps confronting it. It's a sin that is oftentimes so precious to them, they'll go to their grave with that same sin in their clutches. Uh, Jesus is warning this generation uh, throughout this passage that they will uh, go to hell with that sin in their clutches. And, uh, but, but for them, uh, at this point, repentance is off the table. They're not going to change their mind uh, because John offended them uh, the way he said it or the things that he said or, or the way that it was done. They just, there's something about it that rubbed them the wrong way and they're not going to have it. Um, generally speaking, what I've seen out of people throughout my years in ministry is that when they get to a point where they've decided they're not going to repent, they're going to hang on to the sin issue that is precious to them, and uh, they're not going to change their mind. Uh, once that happens, they have to figure out what they're going to do with the one who keeps bothering them about it. They're going to have to figure out, these guys are going to have to figure out what to do about John, what to do about Jesus. Uh, always this is the case. Um, and so, generally speaking, what ends up happening in a situation like that is since they, they can't disagree with what's being said, they know it's true, they're going to find fault in how it was said. They're going to find fault in the one who said it. They're going to find some reason, because their brain won't shut off until they finally do. They're going to find some reason to dismiss themselves from the accountability that God was trying to provide them with the truth that was spoken by the individual God sent to them. But they won't have it. They won't have it. And if you think that that's unique to individuals or whole generations... It's not. Jesus goes on in that passage to rebuke entire cities. So there are enough people who have that kind of approach to repentance. There are enough stubborn, unrepentant, self-centered men and women that come through the church with that sort of attitude, enough to populate a whole city. And apparently in Jesus' day, there were some. Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, full of people who refused to repent. He began rebuking them for that very reason. In verse 20, it says, because they didn't repent. So, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. He says, if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes, which would have been a sort of physical, visual demonstration of sorrow and sadness. Uh, 
and uh, change of heart, change of mind, sackcloth and ashes. Tyre and Sidon were Gentile cities that were oftentimes the object of condemnation and rebuke in the Old Testament. And uh, they sort of had a reputation among the Jewish people of being very wicked. And here Jesus says, actually, uh, you should think twice because as wicked as they may have been, you're worse. He says the same thing about Capernaum. He says, you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades, hell. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I'm telling you, it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. In other words, Jesus is indicating here that there are degrees of hell. There are degrees of judgment. And I believe that's true. There are degrees of reward in heaven. Why wouldn't there be degrees of punishment in hell? And he says it will be worse for Capernaum than it will be for Sodom. Because if Sodom had seen the works that Christ had done in Capernaum, Sodom would have repented. But again, Capernaum never did. And it's interesting because 50% of the miracles that we saw Jesus do in Matthew chapter 8 and chapter 9 were done in Capernaum. So Jesus has been doing amazing things in that city, and they remained apathetic and indifferent to it. It wasn't enough to change their mind. And it's interesting that Jesus brings up these cities because these unrepentant cities that Jesus is rebuking helps us to understand how Jesus feels about unrepentant people. Unrepentant people. And it's those that are most familiar with the activities of Christ, the workings of Christ. They're most familiar with how he operates in a person's life. Um, it's the people that Jesus attempts to communicate the truth to. It's Jesus who goes out of his way to get into their life and, and sit them down and warn them and convict them. It's those who, after hearing that, still won't repent. They still won't change their mind because they are settled. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 48 tells us that you're only that much more accountable after having been confronted. As Jesus has done with these cities, they are now that much more accountable on the day of judgment because they had the privilege of seeing and hearing what Jesus had presented them with. So Luke 12, 48 tells us that those to whom much is given, much is required. Much more will be expected of them. And these cities were privileged. And there are some people who likewise are privileged. They have been given a full dose of the truth, as uncomfortable as it may have been to receive, but they will reject it out of hand because it was presented in a way that made them feel pain. And so they won't repent and find themselves eventually in the same position as Bethsaida and Chorazin and Capernaum. It'll be better for uh, those that are living in absolute sin than it will be for those in the church who refuse to repent on the day of judgment. I'll bet these folks were surprised to find that out. Probably shocked to find out that Jesus felt this way about them. I think there are some people who, as individuals, are going to be shocked to find out how Jesus feels about them. There's a lot of folks out there that think that they can hide stuff from Jesus a lot better than they actually are. Jesus isn't fooled by anybody. He's given you enough information to save you or to damn you. Every one of us. Jesus gives to every man and every woman, every city and every generation, enough to save them or to condemn them. But he is, I guarantee, listen to me clearly, Jesus is operational in your life right now. He is giving you information and he expects you to be faithful to that information you were given, regardless of how it was presented. Jesus expects repentance of cities, individuals, and entire generations. Nobody is forgotten by God. Nobody is ignored by Jesus. 
not even that proverbial guy on the island who was born out there and lives by himself and never has a missionary and never knows the Bible, nothing. Even him has been given enough truth by God to save or to condemn, depending on how he responds to the truth that he's been given. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit convicts the world. So there is nobody outside of God's purview. He is, as we speak, operational in your life. How are you responding to it? That's the big question tonight. That's a big question every every day of the week, every every step of the way throughout life. How are we responding to God? Have we grown indifferent to the work that he's trying to perform in our life? Like, like Capernaum? Are we now backed into a corner because of our sin? And we're now going to look for an excuse to dismiss the truth that we know? Are we going to live in unrepentance long enough that God finally writes us off and says, your fate is sealed? Where are we at tonight in terms of how we're handling the truth that we have been given by God? Let me pray for you guys as you go into your small groups. Father, we ask that you would be with each one of us, as I know that this is always difficult to hear. I, history proves it in the text we're studying right now. We know, Lord, that we can be rather sensitive when it comes to sin issues. But generally speaking, it's because we cherish sin over truth. If that is us, if we're guarded about our sin, resistant to the truth, stubbornly refusing to change our mind or repent, and we pray tonight, Father, that your Holy Spirit would do a work to break us of that and bring us to a, a place of repentance. We ask, Lord, for your grace and your mercy in doing what you must to keep us from hardening our hearts like so many have throughout history. Please bless our discussion tonight. Let the truth be spoken freely. Give us a great deal of transparency with one another that we might deal with the sin issues that you're addressing. We thank you for the time that we have and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you guys have a good discussion. We'll see you soon.